February 5th, 2016, on Worth Street, Manhattan, a German-engineered crane, freshly inspected, towering 565 feet above the morning rush, was moments from becoming a headline tragedy in just 10 seconds. A $3 million machine collapsed, killing a passerby, shattering glass for blocks, and causing $20 million in damage. The operator followed every protocol except one, the overnight securing step most crews ignored in the pre-digital era. If every regulator said the site was safe, how did New York City's deadliest crane disaster still happen? Here's how a single overlooked decision rewrote every safety rule across America and exposed the hidden risks still lingering in routine. Worth Street in the early morning is a canyon of glass and stone. Commuters cross narrow sidewalks, coffee in hand, heads down against the winter wind. Delivery trucks squeeze past yellow cabs, their engines echoing between buildings that rise 20 stories or more. The sun barely touches the pavement, blocked by towers on either side. In this corridor, air moves differently. Gusts gather speed, funneled by architecture that was never designed to tame the wind. On this particular morning, a 565-foot crawler crane looms over the intersection, its latticework silhouette framed against the sky. The machine's boom stretches high above the rooftops, casting a long shadow across the street. For most, it's just another part of the city's relentless construction cycle. But for those who work beneath it, the crane is both tool and threat, a presence that demands respect, especially when the weather turns. Wind speeds are not just numbers here, they are felt as invisible pressure, rattling scaffolds, tugging at loose tarps, twisting paper into sudden spirals. Operators and foremen check forecasts, but on Worth Street, readings from distant sensors can't capture what happens between these walls. Human judgment fills the gap. Decisions about safety are shaped by habit, experience, and the memory of close calls. In 2016, Protocols still rely on what a seasoned eye can see and what a steady hand can feel. The city's skyline is a living system, and every morning workers step into its unpredictable currents. Kevin Riley was a veteran operator, trusted with the controls of a $3 million Liebherr LR 1300SX. On February 4th, city inspectors arrived at dawn, clipboard in hand, and found everything in order. The crane passed a full compliance check. No loose bolts, no missed signatures. Inspection complete. The site returned to routine. But as forecasts warned of rising winds overnight, the protocols for securing such a machine were clear. Lower the boom, lock the swing, double check the tie downs. That evening, Riley chose to leave the crane standing, its boom angled high above Worth Street. The forecast called for gusts up to 30 miles per hour, enough to trigger the manufacturer's written warning. Logs show no urgent escalation, no extra call from supervisors. Overnight, the city's wind funneled through the canyon, unseen but relentless. The securing checklist was left unfinished. On paper, the site was still safe. The inspection certificate, issued just 26 hours before, sat in the file as proof. But the real risk was not in the paperwork. It was in the gap between protocol and practice, between what should have happened and what actually did. By morning, the crane's boom remained exposed, the machine vulnerable. Decisions made in the quiet hours before dawn set the stage for everything that followed. In construction, the line between routine and disaster can be as thin as a skipped step. On Worth Street, that line vanished overnight. Wind, invisible yet relentless, became the deciding force that morning. At 8.25, gusts reached up to 38 miles per hour, funneled between stone facades and glass towers. The Liebherr LR 1300DSX stood with its boom at a 72-degree angle, a posture that transformed the crane into a sail, not a spear. In open country, wind might slip past, here, the urban canyon trapped and accelerated it, multiplying pressure against the latticework. The 192-ton counterweight 
engineered to balance vertical loads, was no match for the sideways force now hammering the superstructure. Physics took over where protocol had failed. As the gusts struck broadside, the boom's immense surface area caught the wind, driving lateral loads far beyond design limits. The slewing ring strained, the pivot assembly flexed, and within seconds the resisting moment was overwhelmed. No mechanical flaw, no cracked weld, no failed foundation, just a tipping point where the laws of motion, amplified by city geometry, turned a marvel of engineering into a cautionary tale. Inside the cab, Kevin Riley gripped the controls, eyes locked on the boom angle display. The wind rattled the glass, each gust a jolt through the steel frame. Riley's training told him to lower the boom to bring the machine into a safer posture, but the numbers on the screen lagged behind the urgency he felt in his gut. At 90%, he reached back to press the setup button, a motion he'd made hundreds of times before. This time, the machine lurched. In his words, I feel the machine move. It just went down. The world tipped sideways. Metal screamed as the superstructure twisted, glass shattered, and the cab slammed toward the street. For 10 seconds, nothing obeyed gravity. Shards embedded themselves in his jacket and gloves, the air filled with dust and the sharp smell of hydraulic fluid. When the cab finally came to rest, Riley was alive, battered but conscious. Crawling through fractured glass and bent steel, he found his way out, shaken but intact. The difference between survival and tragedy was measured in seconds and in the thin margin between protocol and reality. Sirens broke the morning quiet as first responders flooded Worth Street. FDNY crews cordoned off the intersection, weaving between twisted steel and shattered glass. NYPD officers directed traffic away from the debris field, their radios crackling with urgent updates. The force of the collapse flattened parked cars and sent fragments of the crane into nearby buildings, fracturing facades and rupturing water mains. Over 100 residents lost access to water and gas. For David Wicks, a 38-year-old mathematician on his way to work, the disaster was instant and final, his car crushed beneath the falling boom. Three others, struck by flying debris, were rushed to area hospitals. The economic toll mounted quickly. Four buildings suffered infrastructure damage, and street closures stretched for days. Cleanup alone demanded round-the-clock labor, with costs spiraling into the millions. In total, the city counted $20 million in losses, an entire block transformed in seconds. The scale of the response made one fact clear. Protocol lapses don't just threaten workers, they ripple outward, touching every life in the city's path. Within hours of the collapse, New York City issued an order that froze every major crane above the skyline. 376 crawler cranes and 53 tower cranes were locked down, their booms lowered and work sites silent. Inspectors fanned out across the boroughs, checking tie-downs and logging wind readings. The city dropped the legal wind limit from 30 miles per hour to 20, a move that forced superintendents to halt jobs at the first sign of risky gusts. Fines for non-compliance doubled overnight, reaching $10,000 per violation. For two days, the city's construction engine stalled, proof that a single lapse could bring an entire industry to a standstill. Trade groups representing New York's largest contractors filed suit just days after the city's emergency shutdown. Their argument was simple. A hard 20 mile per hour wind limit would stop work for weeks each year, driving up costs and forcing operators to raise and lower booms so often that new risks might arise. Negotiations stretched for three months. City officials stood by the need for tighter controls but agreed to a compromise. The wind limit returned to 30 miles per hour, but only if every crane was equipped with an on-site anemometer. Real-time wind readings became mandatory, and enforcement shifted from guesswork to logged data. The new rule balanced safety with the realities of building in New York's unpredictable air. 
Today, every crawler crane in New York runs with GPS tracking and real-time wind sensors. Daily checklist routines, once optional, are now enforced by law. Operators complete enhanced certification and supervisors document every step. The culture of construction has shifted. Protocol is the new habit. On February 5, 2016, a 565-foot crane collapsed in less than 10 seconds on Worth Street, causing $20 million in damage and taking one life. Investigations proved the machine was inspected just 24 hours earlier, yet a missed overnight securing step in 25 miles per hour winds exposed the limits of experience-based safety. The official reports confirmed the root cause was not mechanical failure, but a breakdown in protocol and judgment. Despite extensive documentation, the exact moment the securing decision was made and why warnings were not heeded remains unclear. In response, New York City dropped wind limits from 30 to 20 miles per hour and mandated anemometers nationwide, marking a shift from subjective judgment to data-driven rules. Every crawler crane in the U.S. now operates under procedures shaped by this event. The $20 million collapse stands as documented proof that in construction, protocols are written in lives, not just regulations.